Um, but uh, today for Grand Rounds, we have um, a uh, very interesting and also kind of a fast becoming uh, a Columbia uh, faculty member speaker. Uh, I was going to use the expression, you know, sort of a zebra, a zebra of, of the different stripes, but I don't know if that's politically correct or not. But um, somebody who uh, trained uh, in medicine and psychiatry and then kind of took a, a road less traveled. Um, and that's uh, Sally Sattel. So Sally hails from Queens, uh, Briar, Briarwood. Yes. As uh, she's just informed us. Um, and she received her undergraduate degree in uh, Cornell and then did a master's. What was the master's in? Evolutionary biology. In evolutionary biology at the University of Chicago and then went to medical school at Brown and did her postgraduate training at Yale and remained on faculty at Yale until um, she decided to sort of pursue things in a different way. Um, and uh, along that way, she tried out various things in the realm of um, government policy. She was a Robert Wood Johnson uh, fellow, health policy fellow, and based in the, uh, Senate, the, uh, the office of Senator Nancy uh, Kassebaum from Kansas, uh, and but then found uh, that her literary skills could be put to good use um, as a commentator uh, on the scene about the way mental health care, psychiatry, mental illness uh, is perceived and dealt with in, in society. And uh, towards that end, uh, began to write and also decamped uh, or uh, was offered a position as a base at the American Enterprise Institute um, as a fellow in, in Washington, DC. The AEI is a think tank. Um, and these are kind of coveted positions. I can't say I know how you get them, but they're coveted positions. And a lot of people uh, opine from those platforms on the American scene. And uh, at the AEI, there's uh, one person that I know very well who's a really informed um, and uh, valuable uh, commentator on issues political, but also pertaining to mental illness, which is Norman Ornstein. Um, and was um, Scott Gottlieb also uh, at the AEI? Still, there. Still is, yeah. So Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner, who's got to be one of the smartest people I've ever listened to um, in terms of his fund of knowledge. Uh, but um, Sally, currently uh, is a resident scholar at AEI. She uh, also works um, uh, on the ground uh, in substance abuse clinics, and in this case, a methadone clinic in Washington, DC. Uh, and um, as I mentioned before, in addition to now being a lecturer at Yale, she's also a visiting professor uh, at Columbia um, and getting more engaged in various activities that we have in terms of our efforts to be communicative and to uh, engage the, um, the, the uh, public at large through the media through various formats. Um, she's written widely in this context for academic journals and for lay publications. She also has uh, been drawn into the political scene by providing testimony on various topics to Congress uh, relating to the Veterans Administration. Uh, but you know, her main thing is that she's been a prolific uh, author um, in terms of articles and in terms of books. So some of her books is, include uh, The Drug Treatment, The Case for Coercion uh, by AEI Press, um, PCMD, How Political Correctness is Corrupting Medicine, Basic Books, uh, co-authored One Nation Under Therapy, St. Martin's Press, and also co-authored The Health Disparity Myth uh, a, a, a EI press and when altruism isn't enough, a case for compensating kidney donors, um, a EI press. Uh, and recently co-authored um, with uh, Scott Lillenfeld from Emory, a brainwash, the seductive appeal of mindless neuroscience, basic books. Um, Sally got a, uh, an award for uh, a field project that she's going to speak about today or part about today, which uh, enabled her to spend a year in um, Southern Ohio or Western West Virginia, uh, you know, and, and the epicenter of the opiate epidemic uh, in order to see on the ground what it was doing to that population, you know, which is the population described in the deaths of despair 
work and um, uh, one that's been sort of implicated as the you know, most intensely affected victim of the opiate epidemic. Uh, so uh, in any event, she will be speaking about that experience um, in some part. And the title of the presentation is The Sixth Vital Sign, Lessons of the Opioid Crisis. So please welcome Sally Sattel. Thank you. I think I need my Karen here <laughs> for just uh, technical stuff. So you just going to share the screen. I remember that. And then, uh, yeah, you can go to, oh, you can leave it on that. Oh, and then I'll just, yep, no problem. Okay, apologies. Thank you, uh, You're Karen. And thank you, Jeff, for a, and such a nice introduction and for being so welcoming to me and everyone I know here, uh, a mere fraction, I, I think, of the faculty, but uh, just have been uh, really wonderful to me. So I really appreciate that. Um, so um, I'm going to talk to you today about some lessons from the opioid epidemic it's, or crisis. It's been going on now about 20 years, depending on where you would draw the inception point. And some of what I'm going to say, I'm sure, will sound familiar, but I frankly hope a lot of it doesn't. Uh, now, the title of my talk is obviously a play on the fifth vital sign, which is uh, was a public health um, message that was coined in 1995, I think, by the American Pain Society and then adopted by the VA system in 1999. And, and it was uh, a plea to uh, doctors and, um, and all health professionals to take pain as seriously as the other four vital signs, uh, you know, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and so on. And, um, and to uh, uh, just emphasize how important pain is, an assessment of pain is to the general well-being of a person. So the sixth vital sign is obviously my idea. And uh, I would say it of applies to the body politic in that um, it it means to me that we um, you know all should understand uh, in a way I'm talking more of the public than a lot of well you know well informed health mental health professionals but um, in the context of the opioid crisis it, it refers to the incredible complexity of this um, phenomenon which is as, as social as, as it is medical and public health. And this is all in an effort to get to get beyond the standard narrative of the crisis, which now seems to be just in full bloom with HBO specials and and best selling books. Uh, more to come about the um, the contour of this of this crisis and its origins. And and uh, what I'm referring to specifically is what I'd say a very streamlined and oversimplified narrative that uh, focuses on the unfortunate actions of some opioid manufacturers who had a definite role in the problem, not trying to excuse anyone. Um, but they, these narratives often put uh, pharmaceutical companies at the forefront. And the narratives, I believe, often adopt a notion of addiction that is, from my viewpoint, too reductionist, too biological. And, um, and, and kind of create this image of an of opioids as an overpowering substance that uh, um, com you know completely dominates an, kind of an innocent brain. But a much richer account is starting to emerge and and probably will continue to emerge in the next few years. But that's the story I want to talk about is is the sorry about this. okay. Um, I want to elaborate on the complexities that have become obvious to us. So I'm going to start with an overview of uh, the epidemiology briefly. I also want to talk at some in some depth about the phenomenology of addiction, because I feel that's been, um, as I said before, I, I feel that's been um, uh, talked about in a, in a kind of um, a black box sort of way, you know, boom, people become addicted. Well, there's a, you know, there's a process, there's a psychological process too. I want to talk about opioid pain relievers and, uh, and show data that will allow us to be more realistic about the threats they do pose and to whom they are posed. Um, I want to go back to enriching this, this narrative 
and, uh, and close with some uh, lessons that we've learned. So um, I'm gonna, um, as I, I mentioned, uh, the general epidemiology, I'm sure you've seen this uh, slide a hundred times. And um, so there we are uh, with the, um, the black representing prescription opioids, you know, Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycontin, uh, Roxycodone, et cetera. And um, the gray is heroin and the, uh, um, the blue is fentanyl and other synthetics. And uh, basically you can see in 2011, that, that's a really significant breaking point um, where uh, pills were ascendant in terms of being involved in opioid deaths. And it always you have to say involved because most people succumb with multiple substances in their bodies. And it's sometimes hard to know what actually, you know, it's the synergistic effect that actually caused the, the death. Um, but uh, we're in a phase now where pills uh, play a minor role and the, the synthetics have, have taken off. And at the end of 2019, there were, which is the last uh, you know, official measurement by the uh, CDC, 48,000 opioid overdoses, and uh, which actually increased during the pandemic and inc started to increase prior to the pandemic. Um, so phase one is considered uh, the pill phase, so to speak. And uh, the year 2011 gets very interesting. And I'm gonna come back to that as I said, the pressing problem is no longer pills. And in fact, in 2019, uh, pills themselves contributed to only 6% of the overdose death. So that, in other words, they were the sole, um, uh, they were the sole substance um, in, at, at autopsy. Uh, phase two is heroin that started around 2011, and then that was superseded by fentanyl, which, as you know, is 50 times, roughly 50 times the potency of heroin and about 100 times the potency of morphine. And that has really taken off since 2014 and now dominates the picture and is, in most major cities, is a significant um, percentage of any heroin uh, one purchases. And of course, um, it's highly deadly. So we probably have fewer people using uh, who are addicted to opioids, but the death, it's really an overdose epidemic, you could say. It's the overdoses that are now um, uh, most um, st striking and, and shocking um, due, due, to, due to fentanyl. So now I'm gonna show a slide of someone whose face is, I think has never appeared in a Grand Rounds and maybe never again will, but this is Anthony Bourdain, who is um, sadly no longer alive, wonderful, just such a wonderful um, personality and a uh, man. Anyway, um, so I want to talk about him because people probably know he did have a drug problem, which he ultimately um, conquered. But in this is from a show he did, um, or what I want to talk about is a show he did in 2014 when he visited Massachusetts. And um, uh, he started off, this must have been one of his more personal shows, because he started off at, at Cape Cod or in Provincetown, where he worked as, um, I think, his last year in high school. He spent the summer there, and, and it was a drug fueled summer, but it's, it's like recreate, a lot of recreational drugs, marijuana, quaaludes, LSD, psilocybin, mushrooms, bar, barbiturates, um, still around in 72, barbiturates. And, um, and he visited his old haunts and that was, that was very interesting. Then um, he actually moved to the Lower East Side after he finished um, high school to cook professionally. Uh, he said he developed delusions of culinary grandeur at, uh, on Cape Cod and pursued that on the Lower East Side in 1980 where he became um, very much involved with heroin for seven years, although he did quit um, on his own and then crack. He was also a huge problem. He was homeless, I believe for a time, but he uh, again uh, was past all that by his early thirties, which is actually the epidemiological trend for, for quitting. Um, and uh, so during his show, he also wanted to visit. Is there a prophecy? Um, um, prophecy mm -hmm. Oh, apologies guys. Oh, okay. Um, and what I liked having the iris. Hmm. Sorry about this, folks. 
I can't see the slides that are coming up next. So um, anyway, apologies. So he, uh, while he was in Massachusetts, he went in 2014 and visited a town um, in uh, Western Massachusetts called uh, Greenfield. And that town um, was a gutted mill town and it was a hub of opioid addiction in that area. And of course, Massachusetts was really the, the Northeast and Appalachia were about the hardest hit and certainly um, the, the, the original hotbeds of, of uh, opioid and specifically Oxycontin use. So he met in uh, sat in a meeting room with uh, folks who were in an, um, you know, support uh, recovering addicts, uh, people, recovering folks who were in a support group and they all you know, kind of went around the room telling war stories and how they got involved with with their drug and um and what he said was so striking to me he was really when his turn came he, he kind of searched for words but this is what he said um when he was asked why did he turn to heroin and he said it's like something was missing in me whether it was a self-image situation whether it was a character flaw there was some dark genie inside me that I very much hesitate to cause call a disease and that led me to dope. Uh, now, dark genie is obviously a metaphor. It's certainly not very scientific, but in the context of a, um, you know, a person's life, it really does get you to think more broadly about addiction and what was the dark genie that prompted him to use. Now, um, addiction as a phenomenology is, is, is conceptually challenging. And this has actually been a matter of uh, debate and contrast, uh, I mean, excuse me, conflict um, for a long time. I mean, I think the DSM definition is fine. It's just descriptive. It's, it's basically use, um, which the user perceives a, a lack of control. And um, this continued use um, interferes with, with uh, function and, and performance. And I, I, that's a perfectly fine observation. And like most of DSM-3, it's a theoretical. It doesn't tell you, you know, why this happens, but um, it's a fine description. And then there are, uh, you know, explanations that folks have offered and from various perspectives. Um, one perspective quickly, you can see here is the neuroscience, not, sorry, not neuroscientific. And that's where the brain disease, which is the most, I'd say, probably the most common conceptualization of addiction, that's where that resides. But a behaviorist and econ economist will talk about shift, uh, risks and benefits. Um, some talk about um, a develop addiction as a developmental problem, reflecting failures of maturation, poor self-control, stable sense of self. Then there's a sociological perspective, peers, um, identifying with marginal groups, adapt really adaptations in some cases, um, and responses to poverty or alienation. And finally, the psychodynamic uh, vision, which is more about self-medication and uh, those kinds of things. So I, I think there is merit to, to every one of those um, conceptualizations. Um, but I, I'm not sure that anyone in particular best captures it. But together, they um, reinforce a very important truth, which is that, you know, addiction is powered by multiple intersecting causes. And I, I tend to think in terms of biological, psychological, social, cultural, um, you could put it behavioral in there, I suppose, and as another layer, as, as explanatory levels, not really ranked levels at all. Um, they're almost on a plane, an equal plane, but um, and these are all ways you can describe addiction. You can describe addiction from the standpoint of neurobiology. You can describe it by, more biologically, uh, psychologically. Um, I, I, these are all levels at which um, causes and uh, factors that sustain addiction play out. And, um, and it really depends upon the individual. Everyone's uh, you know, different in terms of the influence of these or the relative influence of these levels of, of analysis. Um, some may be more potent than others. 
and uh, some may be more potent than others over the course of an episode of addiction or if in the future, if there is a relapse. So in other words, someone might relapse because they are in, uh, they find themselves back in contact with other people who use, some may be responding to the death of um, a parent or some kind of a big loss, others um, may be uh, responding to trauma, all these, these kinds of things, uh, are, they're all relevant, but they're all highly individual. And um, I think probably one of the most striking illustrations of that is the, the, uh, the story of the Vietnam veterans, which I suspect folks have heard, but um, basically uh, at least, roughly 20% of all veterans or GIs at the time in Southeast Asia, developed uh, addiction to heroin and it was really good quality, you know, in Vietnam. And the government, President Nixon was actually terrified that the men, mostly men, would come back and then continue their habits here and intensify the drug problem, which was also raging in inner cities at the time. So he instituted a a program, interestingly, called Operation Golden Flow, where uh, of GIs had to give a, a urine screen, a urine test, and if it was negative, they could go home, and um, otherwise they had to go through a detox program. And um, you know, one might have predicted, since the thinking at the time was once an addict, always an addict, that they would just resume use um, when they got home, but they didn't because so many of the factors that were perpetuating drug um, use there, one being its ubiquity, but um, uh, but mostly it was as a way to medicate intense boredom and intense terror, which is what war often is, lots of boredom and moments of intense terror and possibly also PTSD. Well, that wasn't present when people got back. The quality of the drug was, was far less uh, potent than it is now um, and far less so than it was in Vietnam. And um, and also they had responsibilities and wives and jobs and, and the environment was completely different and you had to go into dangerous neighborhoods at the time to get them. So everything changed. And I just mentioned all of those, uh, I didn't mention dopamine, but that's in there. Um, that's all of these various levels on which these forces operate. So it's a complicated problem. And, um, and it's, it's relevant to, um, this situation because uh, again, you have to, I often think of addiction as more of a symptom than a disease. Um, I mean, I certainly would never debate anyone who wants to call it a disease. And if, and if, a pa if that is how a patient is making sense of the problem, I would never debate them. But just from a you know conceptual standpoint, I think when you think about it as a symptom, which means, well, what is the underlying cause? Um, it's often more enlightening at the social and psychological level, which is where most of our you know, inter interventions really um, apply. Um, now, anyone who's re read an addiction memoir um, knows all this. And uh, the theme that seems to come across most, most powerfully in so many addiction memoirs, some of these are alcohol, but same general principle, of course, is that um, people are struggling with an enormous amount of self of self-loathing. And um, for good reason. I mean, this drug works. This particular quote from Homer is not about self-loathing, but it is about opioids being what I would call an oblivion, you know, not, not a euphorian, not a depressant, but a, 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 an oblivion. They can be euphorians, definitely, but in sustained use, it's often as an oblivion. And, uh, and you can read it for yourself how numbing it can be when people are in agony. Uh, this is obviously agony uh, of loss, but there's all kinds of, of, of personal agony. And um, the drugs serve a purpose, and that's so important. And um, and we, we know that uh, because, um, I mean, we know how important that is be, because we have so many, that's why so, folks are so ambivalent often about coming into treatment. And that's why, um, you know, even though statistically, most people, unless they have a concurrent mental illness, will, will quit um, by the time they're in their 30s, unless fentanyl gets them first these days. Um, we know that, uh, people who uh, the majority uh, do not uh, take 
treatment, even when it's accessible, and I understand access is a separate and significant problem. And when they do, the dropout rates are about 50% at six months. And, um, and that makes sense because kind of banishing the dark genie, so to speak, takes a lot of time. And that's why this often takes years to recover. So keep this in mind as I move to back to opioids. So a little whiplash here. Now we're back to data and um, prescription opioids themselves. So the point I wanna make here in the next few slides is that these drugs are not overpoweringly addictive. They are addictive, there's no question about that. But um, out of this, out of 87.1 million people who've used it, 2% um, have developed a pain reliever use disorder. And you know that means anything from, uh, can mean anything from misuse to, to florid uh, addiction. So um, I think a lot of uh, the average person would be very surprised to see that because all we hear is about how devastating these medications are. And uh, that is a relatively, still is a lot of people, but it's a relatively small um, percentage. Um, so with that in mind, I want to just also briefly mention the addictiveness among patients now. This is a population, population view, but as far as patients for whom opioids are prescribed, I'm just gonna run through some numbers here. And these are representative. Um, I certainly can supply a lot more citations for anyone who wants them. Um, there was a Washington University study from 2016 that did a survey of 700,000 uh, Wells Pharmacy claims and 0.3% developed abuse or addiction within a year after receiving at least one prescription, prescription for opioids, because that's 0.3%. Um, another found, this was a research team at Harvard in 2018, this was for acute pain. Uh, only 0.6% showed signs of abuse and addiction in over half a million privately insured post-surgical patients. Um, that's acute. Chronic, now this is chronic I'm talking about here. Um, Triangle Research Institute team, again, found a range of 0.12% to 6%, okay? Um, the Cochrane Library, uh, the Cochrane Library is a kind of a consortium that does uh, well-respected reviews and found signs of addiction. Um, well, you can see 0.27. And then uh, another uh, review article that uh, summarized the uh, range was the one from uh, Velkow and uh, McClellan in the um, excuse me, New England Journal of Medicine were averaged less than 8%. Well, um, that's kind of interesting. You know, why, why this range? Um, and I think the range tells us a lot. You know, how can it go from well under 1% to 8%? I mean, it's still a huge, there's an order of magnitude times eight, and eight um, difference. Well, this very um, enlightening study, I think, from the University of Miami by David Fish. Spain and others, it was pub published in 2008, really is, is quite enlightening. Um, basically, uh, in summarizing 24 studies, they found that a nuance rate of new onset abuse or addiction at 3.27%. So that's less than the 8% that, that Volkow uh, had in her paper. Um, but when he separated out the studies that had specifically excluded people with um, previous or current substance abuse, uh, the rates went down significantly to 0.19%. And, um, and they, they very much warned that these low rates should not be generalized to an unselected population. Um, that is really uh, important because it shows that when you separate out a specific uh, subpopulation of folks who are at special risk for addiction, you do get significantly lower rates. Now, obviously, we don't do that when we see people. They're still treated like you know, everyone else. But it says a lot about um, but it says a lot about risk factors. And it also says, unfortunately, that doctors 
doctors who treated pain, not, you know, in the end, in the early 2000s, the end of uh, 1900s, I mean, excuse me, 1990s, um, you know, were not pain specialists. And that was the whole idea behind the pain movement that started in the mid 80s and really got traction in the mid 90s and was really roaring in the 2000s, which was to expand uh, pain treatment to non-cancer patients and that primary care doctors should do much more of it than they had been. And so um, they uh, did, were not prepared to uh, pay special attention to these kinds of historical factors that put people at risk. Doesn't mean you would not prescribe opioids for them necessarily, but uh, you'd have to be much more attentive. And uh, that was a big part of the problem because there's no question that doctors did overprescribe and um, you know, where patients could um, you know, do well with maybe three days or seven days and Tylenol extra strength and a heating pad. Um, you know, they gave a whole month and that sat in the far, uh, medicine chest, which incidentally shows you, look, this is not as addicting as many people would have you believe if, it, if people let it sit in their medicine chest. And in fact, 60% to 80%, depending on the study show that, people don't even finish their prescriptions. Um, so anyway, it was uh, indiscriminately, uh, really promiscuously prescribed and that got diverted, big problem. But again, uh, this all shows that the average person is uh, not at nearly at the risk that we often hear. Um, now just to another population, I think I'm gonna go through this quickly though. Um, I talked about I had just finished talking about people who are prescribed in a clinical setting. And these, uh, this information applies to people who um, were in treatment um, um, programs. Um, and, uh, oh, pardon me, pardon me. Uh, th these are again, also uh, epidemiologic scale studies. And I mean, the important part uh, the important thing here to note is that most of these um, individuals uh, were not, their opioids were not the first drug of abuse, whether they got them at first from a doctor or not, they were not their first uh, drug of abuse. Um, approximately in the Karen C study, 83% of Oxycontin abusers slash misusers report illicit drugs or other prescription medications prior. Um, these again are three studies of, of many. And, um, you know, and that is a very important um, point, these are not substance naive folks. And um, a final study here showing that of people who did go to treatment, 96% um, had this same experience. And so that's, I'm gonna just gonna go through this quickly. And um, another factor, again, attesting to, to the reality that so many of these folks um, were not open, drug naive is that, and this is this is a low estimate, 63% had other drugs in, involved at death. Uh, I saw a study from Florida that where 95% of people who overdosed had other substances in their system. So um, again, more evidence that these folks are not opioid naive. Next slide, well, where did they get them? And this is by now almost an iconic slide. The red slice is from one doctor and um, the rest is from friends or relatives. The friends or relatives category, the majority of those folks were probably prescribed, but they diverted their medications. And you can see on the, um, on the left, all the, other, all the other factors. Now this doesn't say where they got their first um, dose from. And it's, this slide is often misrepresented that way, um, but it shows how their uh, supply was sustained and it wasn't sustained by that one doctor. Um, and even from that one, in that 22%, uh, you know, I think if we did um, ethnographic work, you'd find that um, many of uh, those individuals may have been sustaining their, um, it may have been, their pain may have resolved, but um, a lot of doctors will just keep prescribing things and they didn't tell him, hey doc, it's, I'm better now. So let me just summarize what I said. Um, that the risks of addiction to the average pain patients, um, I believe have been exaggerated in uh, much of the media. Um, and also I, 
I've thought by some um, colleagues uh, and uh, other dogs were in, insufficiently aware of risk factors and um, the prescriptions rarely transform a substance naive person into a naive patient, excuse me, into a opioid abuser or mis someone who abuses or misuses. And the implications of all this, is, as you must um, know by now, um, are that uh, we have aggressively cut back on pills and that needed to be done. There's no question pill control policies had a role, but they became applied in a sense with a machete and not a scalpel. And they ended up having really serious consequences for chronic pain patients now. And that was um, intensified in 2016 when the CDC guidelines, which it, when you read them, these are CDC guidelines for prescribing for chronic pain, and they were intended for, um, they were intended for primary care doctors. And it, it's, I, I personally think those guidelines were fine. They were laid out as suggestions, but they kind of made the fatal error of being specific. <laughs> you should never be specific in a guideline because then it becomes law. And that, um, I mean, it's imagined as a mandate. And so what they said was that 90% should be a lot of caution taken going over 90 uh, morphine milligram equivalents per day. But that was taken as almost a rule that doctors should not exceed that. And, and other uh, systems and doctors had even interpreted as um, patients should be um, tapered off altogether. And um, this has led to um, horrible problems. So uh, for these poor patients, a lot of them, they're called pain refugees. They're trying to find doctors who will medicate them. And doctors are uh, themselves cutting back um, uh, profoundly. I have slides on that, but um, I actually see my time is getting short, so I'm going to move ahead and just talk quickly about, um, yes, quickly about the counterpart to uh, the, dark, the dark genie or dark genie addiction, which is, um, you know, I think you can think of that as um, people addressing their own personal suffering, which comes in many forms, you know, with um, drugs. Uh, so that's a dark genie addiction. It is, it is, um, pardon me, it's fairly, uh, it, it takes place on an individual level. It can take place in people who would appear to have everything. I mean, many of those um, memoir writers were from, uh, you know, intact families and wealthy or middle-class families and had good educations, but there was just something uh, about um, their, uh, just something about their, their inner, inner world, their sense of themselves, again, w w whatever that was, that led them to find drugs the only solution to any kind of relief. Then there are what I call um, dark horizons. So there's dark genies and dark horizons. And dark um, horizons is a, is a, I think of that in a communal, as a communal problem. And um, in other words, where, and this was very much the case of the small town that I had spent a year in that Dr. Lieberman alluded to, it's, the, it's called Ironton, Ohio. It was uh, in the south um, eastern part of the state where um, Huntington, um, West Virginia, which is was written about since day one. They had 28 overdoses on one day in 2016, not all fatal, but um, it did, got a lot of, that place um, had something like 40 out of 100,000 uh, deaths per year during the worst of this from, from opioids, which is enormous, and, and Ashland, Kentucky. So this place was at the um, um, that tri-state area. And it was also a very depressed town like Greenfield, um, Massachusetts, where Anthony Bourdain visited. It was once a very thriving, um, a thriving producer of iron. And then uh, fast forward when the uh, um, automotive industry started to shift in the um, 60s and 70s, um, basically plants started closing down. Uh, and um, people who, uh, you know, young kids who felt they had a future started to pursue it elsewhere. So um, the middle class started hollowing out and you were left with elderly, a lot of elderly individuals 
uh, most people, so many of them on disability or on some kind of um, social support, and then a, um, you know, a younger class of folks who are now sometimes second and third uh, generation um, uh, drug addicted. And um, it's, it's just a very, very difficult life, which um, again, is, is medicated by drugs. These are people who just see no future for themselves. And this is one way that um, people um, try to manage. The deaths of despair, I'm sure you've, um, you know that phrase. I'll just define it the way uh, Case and Deaton do, um, which is basically that the white uh, working class having been undermined by falling wages, loss of good jobs, have been devastated and weakened the basic institutions of working class life, including marriage, church going, and community. And the deaths largely take the form of suicide, uh, liver disease, which is from alcoholism, and overdose, which again is a drug, um, opioids. And so many of these rural places, that what's, that's what we see. And, and pills have been in these areas for a long time. Um, they uh, were there be well before Oxycontin came along. It's just that Oxycontin, because it was so, it's so concentrated, as you know, it's a long acting form of oxycodone and that's all it is um, with a time release mechanism. And, um, and if you just crush it, you release all this medication. At one time there was a 160 milligram pill that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, most are 40 and 60, although there is a, a 100. And remember, the average dose of Percocet is five to 10 um, you know, milligrams several times a day. So it may, may add up to 60 or 40 milligrams over the course of a day. And this is one pill. And if you crush it, um, you know, that is one heck of a rush. And, um, and so um, Oxycontin, when it came along, really destabilized what was kind of a simmering but it's an unmanageable abuse of pills of um, benzodiazepines and, and Percocets and um, um, hydrocodones that have been going on again for years. So, um, so that's um, very important also to recognize that in, in some of these rural towns, the problem as it's often portrayed, didn't start out of the blue in 1996 when drug reps came down there. And, of course, they came down there preferentially because that's where most so much pain medication was already being prescribed. And much of that was because the jobs, uh, the industries were so, so um, backbreaking. Uh, mining is just, um, at least before strip mining, and much of it now is done overground, but depth, uh, you know, deep mines are I mean, utterly brutal. You're probably con contorted, you know, all day fitting in a, a, a four a foot space, um, and dangerous. And um, and so in those in those places, um, doctors didn't have to really be. Uh, their prescribing culture was, of course, we treat non-cancer chronic pain. That's what we deal with. And in the old days, when there were coal camps. Uh, in other words, when the, basically the coal companies owned the towns and they had their coal uh, camp doctor, um, he was like an NFL coach. He would work with these guys, these miners, like to get them back. They had to get back to the mine or they didn't get paid. Um, and the doctor was working for the company. And because the, the uh, workers didn't get paid, they were motivated to, to take the medication so they could go back. And uh, this culture of, of medicating non crank chronic cancer pain it was just endemic. And that wasn't true in places in many urban areas. So that when the pain movement came along, it really wasn't that meaningful in many of these rural towns. And when, and when the overly aggressive um, uh, Oxycontin dealer, dealer, excuse me, slip, Oxycontin drug representatives came down there, kind of they were pushing on an open door, one that was already, uh, um, you know, completely, uh, or a, a, an approach to pain and pain medication is completely consistent with medicating non-cancer chronic pain. So it's sort of very different down there. And I think that's one of the big reasons why those were, and also Maine where logging and fishing is also very dangerous, so many injuries. Um, and that's why they were the hotbeds because the prescribing culture and attitudes towards pain medication and, and opioid taking 
as pills didn't have to um, didn't have to be changed. So let me move on to uh, I'm gonna oh this is a slide from Ironton. I'm going to skip past some slides because I want to get to um, uh, questions. But this shows again how the uh, prescribing was starting uh, before 1996, and in fact it was even starting in the 80s um, where. Uh, Opioid prescribing um, again. These are um, these are pharmaceutical deaths. So again, I, I keep saying this: OxyContin was not the beginning. It certainly was an accelerant, um, but it wasn't the beginning. And it, and this is just more context. And I think it's very important. Um, and there was a lot of education that had to be done, but again, not in many rural, these rural towns that I'm talking about, but in 1985, the average doctor was very uncomfortable with um, opioids. Well, we've come back to that um, situation now. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go past this because I already basically spoke about the fact that the, uh, that the pain movement was starting to gain momentum in the 80s. And, um, and this is just information from the Institute of Medicine showing that in addition to compensating for the fact that that pain relief, to some extent, even cancer, let alone non-cancer chronic pain was undertreated. Um, there were also differences in the medical uh, world that um, increased the need. So what we had, so we started from behind and then there were reasons to even prescribe more during the, um, during this period because after about the 80s um, to 90s and 2000s, there was, you know, much more uh, patients became much more active as, as consumers and uh, wanted their pain treated. Uh, we lived longer. You can can read them, increased survivorship and increased frequency and complexity of surgery. So this added to the need. So I'm going to, um, I mentioned that. I mentioned also that um, doctors were very, uh, now have become very skittish about, um, about prescribing. And, um, I, and you can see from here that it's, it's, it's extremely hard to find a doctor who will treat patients uh, are also being, um, it's a big problem. Patients are also being withdrawn, tapered very rapidly. And this is just a plea to uh, pay attention to that from some stakeholders. Also suicide is a problem. And this is just a, a poster of a colleague who's doing a study um, trying to uh, quantify, uh, you know, trying to do more, get more of a registry on how often this does happen. Okay. so. I have two more slides and I'm wrapping up. So I wanted to reinforce the fact that, um, again, very complex web of causes here for the crisis, and it involves every one of these entities, the pharmaceutical companies that um, uh, aggressive or that promoted in ways that were too aggressive. Um, had a good medication. It's a, it's a good medication when it's taken well, but I mean, taken properly. The DEA Drug Enforcement Agency was notoriously lax, and Congress has looked into this extensively in uh, what's called uh, monitoring so-called suspicious orders. You know, why, are, why is this drug, why is this pharmacy ordering so much? Well, they are supposed to be the, the arbiter of, of this. They're supposed to be the watchdog to keep, keep, keep an eye on where their orders are coming from and flag them and, um, and look into this. They were very lax. Drug distributors are companies like McKesson. Basically, they take the drugs um, to the pharmacies. They receive the orders. They are also supposed to flag suspicious orders. That's a problem. State pharmacy boards didn't um, um, respond uh, as well as they should have. Um, and Medicare and Medicaid, um, paid uh, the basically became very cheap to get these drugs, which are really quite expensive. And so doctors had no incentive not to um, prescribe. Also good faith doctors were really pressured. A lot of them were inexperienced. Medicare and Medicaid were basically um, ranking them. I mean, there, there was a um, 
kind of a, a rating of how responsive to pain they were. And so doctors didn't want to get bad ratings from patients. And then, then there are corrupt doctors and some of them ran pill mills and that was pill mills are illicit. Basically, um, they just cash for pills or possibly Medicare for pills, but doctors didn't examine you or they waved a stethoscope around. Um, a great uh, supplier, neighbors sold pills and, um, and individuals used pills and um, they need treatment, they need help, but that's part of the, that's part of the dynamic. So it's very complicated. And I will close by just talking about what I consider to be the lessons of this, um, of this crisis, which is not over. Um, you saw the, the fentanyl um, situation and now there's a fourth, um, some folks uh, refer to the fourth wave, which is now stimulants. And what's making stimulants are not necessarily that, um, I mean, they're risk, you can certainly die from cocaine and crack, but um, they're not as deadly as opioids. But now they are becoming quite deadly because they're typically sprinkled with fentanyl. Um, so here's my in summary, uh, as far as drug abuse and addiction, I have to look at that as a much more dynamic and context um, important uh, uh, phenomenon. Exposure itself is not sufficient. And I've, I've just seen too many, um, too much representation of, base, uh, of, of what I would almost call the infectious disease model, which is to say like COVID, if opioids are around, people will catch addiction. No, it's not like that. There must be demand and there must be vulnerability. That um, two is that uh, there's a lot of danger to clamping down without alternatives. Um, when oxycotton uh, was reformulated so that it was harder to crush in 2010, um, many, uh, paid, not many pain patients, but many people who were abusing went on to um, use heroin. And, um, and when pain patients couldn't, and when, so that was for folks who were abusing it. And then pain patients, when they were denied, you know, there wasn't enough um, to, medications in the, uh, you know, other approaches electric stimulation, um, more physical therapy, more integrated pain management. There wasn't enough for that. Um, there also wasn't, again, back to people with drug problems, there wasn't sufficient treatment at the time. So you so got to be very careful about stopping um, access to, to, to substances without having uh, substitutions in place. Um, we'd avoid this simple narrative, as I've been saying. And also that we have to... Um, realize that the, this crisis goes way beyond um, medicine and public health. It's very much a, a social phenomenon. And to have humility as, um, as uh, psychiatrists, and I think a lot of us do, but I think sometimes, sometimes we need more, a little more of that. This is a big reparative project, and it's not easy. Uh, the good news, because I want to end on a optimistic note is I think actually there's a greater appreciation of these dynamics and there's really ever been for other um, when other substance abuse um, epidemics have been um, with us crack being probably the methamphetamine being the most uh, high profile before this we've expanded treatment significantly still need more but significantly and and less um punitive criminal justice responses so this is all very healthy if no question those will sustain and that'll be something good to have come out of this but um but the larger picture i feel is not appreciated enough and so this is what as i say i really have to aim this largely at the public because sophisticated psychiatrists know this but know that I think the public doesn't appreciate many of these nuances and it's not being presented that way often. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Stell. That was really it's just such a fascinating talk. Um, it's incredibly helpful um, to hear your perspective and, and really understand that, you know, how, how complex these issues are um, and, and such a useful corrective against um, our sort of um, oversimplification of, of both risk and uh, the potential for um, you know, reductionistic models when we think about substance use. Um, so there, there's lots of, uh, lots of questions coming up, um, but I, I guess I, I wanted to, to get us started with one question. Um, 
And I, I, I realize this to some extent is playing um, devil's advocate, but I, I wanted to get your thoughts. Um, so you mentioned the Anthony uh, Bourdain example of the, um, what was it, the, the dark genie. Yeah. And, you know, I, I guess I, I wonder if there, there's some risk um, in, 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 in um, taking too much into that in the, in the sense that, um, you know, it, it suggests that um, there were sort of psychological deficits that he was suffering from uh, prior to using substances, and that was what spurred on his or motivated his use. Um, but it's also um, possible that the, the chronic significant substance use that he engaged in discolored his memories and sort of cast, you know, cast a shadow over, over his, his memories and how he perceives his past. Um, and I guess I would like to get your, your thoughts on that potential concern. Well, um, I think that, I mean, I don't think there was any other evidence of the brain damage, so to speak, or cognitive compromise. So I don't see why that would be isolated. But I suppose a stronger response to that is to say, it's so universal um, that I, I can imagine that so many uh, people who've had, um, you know, significant problems with drugs would talk about it in the same way. I mean, the same way, meaning that they can tell you why. Like, I mean, this is something I always think about, with, again, with uh, the brain disease formulation, which I admit I have a kind of a personally, <laughs> a personal antagonism towards. Um, uh, but I understand that it's very common and, and some people find it useful. And, and I understand its origins. It was meant to drag it, you know, out of the punitive arena and into the therapeutic and to reduce stigma. And those are all very laudable goals. Um, but, you know, if you were to ask someone with a classic brain disease like Alzheimer's and stipulate, you, you ask the person before they, you know, were too, too diminished, you know, why do you have Alzheimer's or why do you have Parkinson's? Maybe that's a better question. Uh, well, why did you get Parkinson's? And I mean, unless this person is a, you know, can, is a neuroscientist who could give you a, some kind of mechanistic explanation, um, well, in a way, that's where the explanation would reside in, in brain mechanisms. Um, well, my dopaminergic system, I, I don't know, or my, I have a family history, I have a genetic loading for this, but that's the kind of response you would get. You, you wouldn't get an existential response the same way if you ask someone who had an alcohol problem or a drug problem, why you use alcohol or why are you addicted or, you know, why do you use heroin? What? That is a meaningful question in the existential realm. And um, it's not in, um, again, asking someone who has a, what we call an organic brain problem, because a person um, uh, struggling with the substances will, if, would write you a memoir if they could. And, um, and that's just where, um, you know, where the need, I, I can't even, I mean, I appreciate that, you know, there's a book called Dope Sick and, um, and I think it, it wildly overstated the role of, now not that this person had this in mind, but some people will say, no, people continue to use because they don't want to experience withdrawal. And that is um, very true. That, that, it, that the avoidance of withdrawal is a reason people will take the next hit. You know, they don't, they don't want to experience it. It's very noxious. And I think it probably gets worse over time. I wouldn't be surprised if people get a kind of half biologia to, to that. Um, but um, so that sustains it. And then there's craving. And we know we've seen the fMRI light up when people are exposed to people smoking crack and they've looked, and I don't, my brain wouldn't light up. I don't have that memory, that encoded memory. So um, that's all there and that perpetuates use. But if that were, if withdrawal, for example, was all there was to it, then any person with a opioid problem would be fine. They'd be cured with um, methadone. They'd be cured with buprenorphine. They'd be cured with the replacement because they wouldn't be experiencing withdrawal anymore. And um, but that's rarely the case. There's just so much more work to do on, on repairing things at two levels. One is the, the level th that propelled someone to find drugs rewarding for their life, despite the damage. And then the secondary set of problems that have been generated during their episode of addiction. 
Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to give uh, Dr. Lieberman a chance to, to comment and ask any questions. Well, I'm going to uh, deflect uh, your uh, invitation to to uh, see if Fran Levin, uh, director of our uh, substance abuse uh, area uh, research, to uh, uh, opine on any comments she wants to share. Fran, are you there? Can can Fran be recognized, uh, Simon? Sure. One second. Maybe while while Simon's trying to connect, uh, Fran Levin, I will. Um, Maybe I'll read some of the questions from the, from the audience. So the first question is from Andrew Levin, um, who writes in, as a student of evolutionary biology, I wonder if you have considered that our brains did not evolve to manage the flood of dopamine released by substances. We are not prepared for this flood and easily overwhelmed by its effects and consequences. Please comment. Um, oh, that's probably true. But, um, but I would say that, uh, so I don't disagree with you, I guess to, I would say the interesting question comes and why do some people um, is why some people uh, don't let it over. And I will say, don't let it overwhelm them. I realize that's probably a little controversial thing to say. Um, I mean, here's the scenario. Uh, you know, you have two young kids who are basically matched on almost every obvious variable. You know, they're same age, same education, same basic, well, say feeling of, you know, uh, socioeconomic, whatever. And they go to a party and neither of them have ever tried cocaine. And they think, oh, well, you know, let's try it. Um, and one tries it and has what's frankly the typical reaction to first time use, which is, <laughs> so, you know, meh, it's not a big deal. Um, it just doesn't blow your mind. But the other person is in the minority of people who does have his mind blown, loves it just thinks it's phenomenal. And that is really interesting. I mean, that's a fascinating question for neuroscientists. Um, and um, so please work on it. The, uh, but then there, uh, another day, two more kids uh, say, hey, I never tried cocaine before. Yeah. And the same business, one tries it and uh, says, uh, wow, I love it. You know, can I have some more? And the other one says, wow, I love it get it away from me. Uh, and I, I don't mean, I, I don't tell the story in a moralistic way. I just mean, um, it's the kinds of, there's risk taking, uh, there's a kid who says, wow, that's great, give me more because um, I'm having a huge fight with my girlfriend and I am worried about my future and, uh, you know, is under, again, all kinds of stress and, you um, maybe some dark genies in there, or less, you know, I, I just have impoverished self-esteem and this is the first time I've ever felt good, give me more. And, um, you know, and the other one says, I have too much you know, to lose because I like this too. I mean, how many folks have, uh, you know, broken a leg and gotten on Percocet and said, wow, I see why people really like this, but then they finish the dose and then they, you know, go back to work. So again, um, I think there are two ways of looking at that. And the first way is why the responses are different uh, 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 at the level of reward is fascinating, but then there's this other level too. I think Dr. Levin has uh, joined us. Yeah, hi, Sally, how are you? That was a great talk. Um, you know, the funny thing is, is to, this whole week is the College on Problem of Drug Dependence. So oh, many of us are toggling. I'm not there. <laughs> so many of us are toggling. So I only caught the second half of your talk because I've been trying to do two things at once, maybe on first half was very good. No, but, the, but, the, <laughs> but the second half, I mean, I actually agree with everything you've said in the second half of the talk, because I think that what I've noticed and I was one of the few people, at least you know, it's even in my division, that was very concerned about uh, demonizing opioids because I think they have a real important place in our treatment of, of people with pain. Um, and I think that recognizing that most do not go on and have a substance use disorder uh, and, and sort of patient dumping, which is what happened, had some really egregious consequences. I think the unintended consequences is patient dumping, as well as what you were saying about people moving on to heroin. Um, and you know the second phase of the opiate overdose epidemic, de overdose death. So I appreciated that being brought to the table, but I also think what, what you also said needs to be emphasized is it really is 
not just a function of availability, but also the, the mindset of the person using and the, and the genetics and, and the, the, the trauma that people have had in their lives and all the other psychological and psychiatric factors that play in to who winds up having a problem with it. Um, certainly, I also agree that there was to, to, too much indiscriminate prescribing and, and not enough training and, and not a recognition that people at risk, and sometimes you cannot predict who those people will be, um, of, of developing uh, problems with, with opiates and other drugs. And I think that that has to be emphasized that, um, and, and the same thing's happening with marijuana right now. Jeff and I have talked about the fact that, you know, now marijuana is all good. And, you know, clearly the percent of people that are going to get addicted to marijuana is lower than with opioids, particularly when the root of, that's another thing, the root of administration is crucial. And you brought that up in your talk. Um, but there is a percentage of people who are going to get addicted and get dependent on marijuana. And they are, and the numbers are going up because as there's wider availability, even with something with uh, low abuse liability, there's going to be a greater percentage of people with the problem. And I think that I hate the fact that there's demonization or, uh, or feeling that a drug or drugs have no problem at all. And then Jeff's addressed that with psychedelics as well. I mean, there's no free lunch with any of these drugs with abuse liability, but they do have a place, but it's, you have to look at it in a controlled way. Um, so those, the, I mean, I, I agree pretty much with everything you said, so. Thanks, and I do worry that this new generation of doctors, not, not us, but you know, internists, are gonna be, are now been so scared off opioids, but they're not gonna know how to treat it, uh, treat people um, in pain. Uh, not everyone needs opioids. We've been way too, there's no question, a lot of people treated with opioids probably could have done well uh, with other interventions, but sometimes they're just essential. Yeah. And yeah, well, I there was a, a lot of the opiate prescribing was in, in dentist's office and most people can get mol, you know, third molar extractions without opioids. And when I talked to people in other countries, they were shocked to hear that most yeah. dentists at one point were prescribing opioids for extractions, which wasn't necessary. So there has to be some middle ground of figuring out who really needs them and who doesn't. Let, 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 me, let me add a comment, if I might, Jonathan, um, which is, you know, there seems like, as you pointed out, Sally, sort of two, two um, tracks to try and uh, unpack the uh, addiction uh, problem uh, by, you know, one is, is the, you know, the biologic susceptibility and, you know, why people react to it and, one way or another way and why it becomes something that they're uh, sort of seduced into, into repeating the experience with. And then as, as Norris says, uh, having their brain get hijacked, which I believe, you know, in terms of your question about whether addiction is a disease or not, a uh, brain disease or not, it, it's, you don't start out with it being a disease, but after you've used, it may be a qualify for whatever your Cox postulates are for, for a disease. But the other one is what I wanted to ask, uh, mention, which is um, how did it get to this point in the United States? So, um, and, and how did the Purdue and the Sacklers become like the poster child uh, for, for vilification? So um, I'm dating myself, but um, you know, the, the, uh, there were several events that occurred. So in the, in the eighties, there was a new theory of pain. You know, you don't wait till pain occurs and then try and suppress it. You, you get out in front of it and you uh, preempt it from occurring because it's easier to preempt than to suppress. Um, and then uh, there was a article, it actually was a letter to the editor in the New England Journal, I think in the early nineties, which was a case series by some doctors uh, describing how they had prescribed. It was like a small case series that they had prescribed to uh, post-operative patients. And uh, it was, you know, done without abuse and without uh, dependence, without withdrawal. And it suggested that, you know, these were like, you know, no uh, abuse potential uh, uh, analgesics. And, and then I guess Purdue in their marketing uh, became more aggressive and more um, deceptive, um, which distinguished them from whatever Johnson and Johnson and the other companies were doing with their, with their synthetic opiates. Um, so, so, you know, there was this process of trying to expand the way in which doctors felt and uh, uh, mandated or, or entitled to prescribe them um, that, you know, led to this proliferation, which, you know, then 
you know, got this out into the population in a much uh, more diffuse and pervasive way. Is that is that consistent oh, with your you understanding? Answered your question. <laughs> it was yeah, Jick and Porter was the article, and um, and it was given to doctors, and doctors, you know, didn't really read it, but it was like something that you know drug reps would be providing them as as, as an explanation for that you couldn't get addicted if you had pain. Yeah, that, it was a 19, right, 1980 letter to the editor, I think literally a yeah. hundred words. I mean, almost a tweet. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, they weren't being deceptive uh, at all. And in fact, in Dreamland, uh, the author contacted Chick and he's horrified. Yeah, he's <laughs> horrified by how it was used. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but I, I, there's no, I don't really question that what those guys reported was true. It's just that it was uh, extrapolated to populations that were, you know, again, most people in an inpatient setting will not get addicted, but especially a short stay. That's true. But then it was, you know, meant to apply to the, what would be the oxycotton population. And that's totally different. Great. Um, there are some dogs barking in my in my yard, so I apologize for the background noise. Uh, but let me let me go through some of the other questions. Are those, are those questions for Sally? Yes. Oh. oh. <laughs> um, so there's a question from uh, Ralph Wharton who asks: You, you had lists uh, different responsible parties, and he asked uh, if the FDA bears some responsibilities for these problems. Oh, FDA. You know that is an interesting. It, it's I have to confess. Um, well, in one one way is um, I think coming up now for question about the whole question of morphine milligram equivalence and and how um, how imprecise they are. There's so many ways to measure them, and so although that's more of a that's more of a practice question. In other words, if you're going to have an MME cutoff, um, then um, you know. What, what 90 MMEs what, under one measurement could barely be 40 under another. And uh, so, but that's not really the FDA. Um, you know, they were, I was reading some hearings from 2001 and Oxy and Purdue had, had sold um, MS, MS Cotton, which was morphine sulfate, long acting morphine sulfate. And that really wasn't that abused. And it could be morphine itself is just less pleasurable, has worse side effects, whatever. And, um, you know, and they assumed that this drug, if, if, if medication, excuse me, you know, taken as prescribed, as prescribed, um, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't have been, been much different. Uh, now you can criticize the, um, the trials, uh, apparently, um, there, I don't even think they did two clinical trials with the FDA, and the one they did was only two weeks long. Um, but they would never probably have done the one that's a year long, which is what you really want to see. Um, but um, but you know, it's uh, hindsight is very very acute, and at the time, again, they were you know had a, a long acting, probably the only I think it's fair to say the only other maybe the first long acting opioid, long acting, I mean, mechanistically made long acting, MS content, content for continuous, and just thought this would just be a substitute. And were they motivated by, you know, business, uh, um, business um, imperatives? Yeah, because the um, patent was wearing off M MS cotton. And so I think they just saw this as a substitute. Now do they take too long to act, well, the, you know, and the FDA stepped in in 2001, they put on a black box. Uh, I don't know. And they, they put, then in 2010, of course, was the reformulation so that it was harder to crush. Um, but then, you know, that had its own consequences. And uh, I mean, I would be interested in hearing, and you can email me afterwards or I don't know if I don't know how much time we have. I'd be interested in what um, they sh you think they should have done. I'm not, I'm not saying they did everything they could have. I'd love to know what more they should have have done at the time. Um, actually, so if, if uh, Dr. Warden wants to join the panel, he could comment on that. Um, but as he's uh, or email me, I really want to. I really want to talk about. It. Um, so there's another question from William Tucker, who uh, asked about training and asked, um, should most physicians learn proper prescription 
should, should learn about proper prescription for opioid analgesics, beginning with training during residency? And would that even be practical given the restrictions around their availability and the dangerousness of storing them? Yes. Um, I think that you start as early as you can um, educating even psychiatrists, or even what I mean is even, even doctor groups that are probably not going to be prescribing it very much because we will have patients who are on it and we want to know how they're taking it and how what their internist told them. Um, I think that, um, yeah, storage has always been a problem. So that's not new, unfortunately. And, and that's a technical problem to, to work on. But I think um, one could argue that in some ways, this may be the safest time to prescribe opioids uh, because there's so much attention to it, um, uh, which is why I, I, you know, I'm very dismaying that we've pulled back so much that this new generation of docs are not going to tell, you know, uh, are very, very wary. I mean, we should, there needs to be a healthy wariness. But again, that wariness, wary, not weary, um, should uh, uh, be focused at how to, uh, you know, screen people as, as best as we can. You're not going to catch everyone, but someone who's had a prior addiction or a concurrent mental health problem, or even just existential in angst, so to speak, uh, which is what may not have a place in DSM, but could, it's extremely powerful. Uh, in terms of uh, d distress, profound distress, to suicidal, you know, provoking distress, um, has to be looked at. And doctors don't spend enough time with patients. Um, I'm not criticizing them. That's the problem of the system. And I almost think almost every problem there is in medicine, uh, if there's one thing that could be done to alleviate so many problems, it's having enough time to talk to people, understand their lives. I mean, if you give Percocet to, a, uh, let's say, a woman who, um, you know, broke her ankle and, you know, five days, not a month and all that, but, and find out that, um, you know, she's going through a really distressing divorce, um, you know, you'd have, to, I think you'd say something like, well, you know, if you need the medication, take it and you might find uh, you feel a little too good sometimes and you're going, I know you're going through a stressful time. So, you know, be aware of that and call me or you know, stop the medication at that point. But um, the point being, understand more about what's going on in people's lives at the time. We don't have time. Uh, let me just ask something regarding this. Uh, uh, this probably is naive, I, sh I should know, but do, you, do we know what proportion of people that have opiate dependence or overuse uh, or addiction, um, is started from a prescription by a doctor for some ostensibly medical purpose, as opposed to um, they get into opiates and they use, you know, doctor shopping as a way of, you know, serving right. their, their need. Um, how much is really tr uh, triggered by the innocent and maybe naive and uh, unca incautious prescription to, to people who then, you know, go down that dark uh, uh, rabbit hole? I tell you, I have spent, it's not a naive question because that answer doesn't exist. Um, I've spoken to people at night. I've spoken to, uh, NSD, you know, look through every NSDUA. They don't ask that question, the first pill question. Um, they don't ask that. So uh, what I can say with uh, um, certainty is that the uh, people, the average person who does become addicted to these pills, prescription medications, wherever they get them, is someone who's not drug naive, and uh, that the average person who's prescribed it in a medical context won't have a problem, uh, but is at higher risk when they have these other um, conditions, and that um, the doctors who sustain the prescriptions in people who abuse, they're that 22%. Uh, in other words, in that pie chart, 22% of people say they get their ongoing substances from doctors, but I don't know where they got their first one. I found one study, actually, I, I, um, I feel a lot more questions move on, I can tell you, but uh, one study that looked at, sorry about this, but Oxycontin in a, in a treatment population and, and less than 1% got it from a doctor, but that's a treatment, that's a substance abuse treatment population. Uh, but less than 1% had a prescription it, initially that they ever had a prescription for OxyContin. That's the best I can do. So
So there's a, a question from uh, Meg Haney who writes in, I agree with the, I agree the current restrictions on opioid prescriptions for chronic pain are draconian slash cruel, but my understanding is that opioids aren't actually that effective for most types of chronic pain and may uh, actually exacerbate them. Well, um, yeah, no, they're not universally um, effective, that's for sure. And I think that's the area of such important study. And I am sure, and I know it's going on, but you know, which are the conditions that respond sort of the best? And we know that, you know, acute trauma um, does post-surgical. Um, I think musculoskeletal often does. Uh, migraines probably don't all that well. I mean, you can go on and on and on. The, the point is to not write them off uh after you've tried other things to, to know that that's always a backup and um either to add them on so maybe you'll need a lot less if people are undergoing other kinds of therapies um or turn to it exclusively if that's the only thing that works um but remember you know the other the other um virtue of oxy uh, cotton was that it didn't have any uh, acetaminophen and it didn't have any aspirin so it was no risk to the liver in that way and the kidneys and the GI tract. Now you can get pure oxycodone. It doesn't have to be in an oxycontin form. So I'm just saying, but that's, um, um, so people shouldn't be taking tons of Percocet because at some point, or Percodan, because you can have all kinds of reactions. And in people with chronic pain, they're often on doses that are horrifying, but necessary and do them, uh, manage them responsibly and probably should, should store their opioids the way people in methadone clinics do, you know, come in with a lockbox. And uh, if you have teen, a teen uh, or your teenager's friends have sticky fingers, you know, a lot of it does uh, come out of the, the medicine chest. Um, but that person, uh, the, the, he, he, I think it was, he is, is right. Uh, the, the medications aren't for all kinds of pain. And I, I think, I, I remember Scott Gottlieb telling me that he was, before he left the FDA, you can argue whether this is an FDA job, but that uh, one of the projects he wanted to undertake was trying to get a sense of which um, kinds of um, painful conditions res responded best. Um, but I know that research is, is going on and it's really important. Great. Thank you so much. So we are uh, just about out of time. Um, I just wanted to thank you again, Dr. Sadal, for that uh, really yeah. wonderful yeah. talk. Wanted to give uh, an opportunity to either uh, Dr. Lieberman or Dr. Levin to say final words. Francis. No, well, I think uh, the main point I would make is that there's nothing is black or white and that we need to uh, have a very thoughtful approach to not just opioids, but all uh, abusable substances. I think the yes. next target of attack will be the use of amphetamines or benzodiazepines. and. A psychiatrist who prescribe a lot of benzo. We don't prescribe as much opioids, but we prescribe many of us yeah. a lot right. of benzo and Ritalin. Yeah, and, and Ritalin, and uh, you know, I, I I treat a lot of people with ADHD. My concern again is sort of in draconian approach. You know, we have to be thoughtful, and we can't be indiscriminate in prescribing of controlled substances. But I think that that's what what makes you a good clinician is knowing when and how to use these medications in a careful, thoughtful way. Um, so I think that, you know, unless we write off all controlled substances, we all have to be aware of the pros and cons and, and be mindful of it. So, yeah, I mean, we, there's, we have a, had a major donor who um, couldn't get, uh, you know, prescription medication, went out on the street, um, bought some, it turned out it was fentanyl laced and uh, overdosed and died. Um, and uh, I'm sure this is uh, not an uncommon occurrence. Um, the only thing I'd say is that, you know, the, the, the story that you presented is obviously multifactorial and much more complicated in terms of its elements. Um, and, uh, you know, the media and the public just don't have an attention span that they want the sound bites. And, um, it, there's a, a real problem in terms of uh, uh, being able to translate you know, science or, or medical knowledge into uh, guidance for not just practice, but you know, to the public because it wants to hear what it wants to hear. And uh, you know, to the point that it's not just not paying attention, but it's not wanting to even believe once they're told. 
So I don't know yeah. what the solution is for that, but um, it's, it strikes me as exemplary of a, a growing problem. Yeah, well, when we stick to a narrow narrative, you miss so many opportunities for intervention. Um, hopefully that lesson will become obvious. Thank you again. Okay, Jonathan, thank you. That was a great uh, discussion, a great talk. And, uh, uh, you know, so you've set the standard uh, high for Michael First and Jeff Reed next week. Uh, Michael, I don't know the other gentleman. I know Michael First will <laughs> be great. Jeff, too. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.